0.8 grams versus 1.6 grams. The great protein debate. That's something I'm going to talk about today, so stick around. Hi, my name is Hachiaki Takamiya. I am the author of Ikigai Biohacking and Libwiser Not Smarter. So my book, Libwiser Not Smarter, is available on Amazon now. Have you had a chance to read the book? If you have, I'd like your feedback. It would be great if you can leave a review on Amazon's book page, or you can give your feedback by a comment to this video. Thank you. And in the book, chapter three, the ideal diet to increase health span, and chapter four, the ideal fasting to increase health span, I delved into this controversial topic that is, how much protein do you really need per day? There have been contrasting views as regards to protein intake. RDA recommended daily allowance is 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. But recently, many experts are saying this is not sufficient. You need 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. And if you are physically active, like if you exercise a lot, or older individuals, you need even more, like 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. So I am 62 years old, and I exercise regularly, so probably I'm in this category that I need 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight. Um, now, so these are recommended by people like Dr. Donald Raymond and Dr. Stuart Phillips. And recently, people like Dr. Rhonda Patrick and Dr. Peter Atia are agreeing with them, and they support this higher protein intake. Uh, for the case of Dr. Peter Tia, he thinks we need 2.0 gram per kilogram of body weight. By the way, I'm talking about increasing your health span. So how much protein do you really need per day to increase your health span? If your goal is to you know, become a bodybuilder or you're competing in some athletic competition, that's a different story. I'm just talking about uh, increasing your health span, so staying healthy into old age. This is more for older individuals like me, you know, people who are over 60 and to stay healthy into old age. How to prevent from, you know, falling and that kind of thing. So how much protein do you really need for that purpose? And for that, some other experts seem to think differently. So before introducing their views, I want to ask you one thing. Have you subscribed to this channel yet? If you haven't, please subscribe. I will appreciate it very much if you subscribe because I have now 9,400 9, subscribers and soon I'll reach 10,000. I'll be very happy if I do. So please subscribe to this channel if you have not. Thank you. Now, for example, Dr. Michael Gurega thinks 0.8 gram is sufficient. And if you try to increase it further, you may have some other risks, such as risk of heart health. And you might activate mTOR. Now, what is mTOR? So there is autophagy and mTOR. You know about autophagy, right? Because I often talk about autophagy. It's a cellular recycling mechanism. This is a function that is considered to be critical for longevity. You need, you need to activate autophagy. And mTOR is the major regulator of growth. This is often considered to be the opposite of autophagy. When mTOR is on, autophagy is off. And when autophagy is on, the mTOR is off. And often, a high-protein diet is considered to induce mTOR. So that's what Dr. Michael Greger is saying. 
if you have a high protein intake, you might induce mTOR, which is not good for longevity. And this is supported by Dr. David Sinclair too. He doesn't talk a lot about autophagy. He talks more about sartuin, but he also thinks that high protein diet induces mTOR and you want to avoid it. He doesn't specify the protein amount. Uh, Dr. Bauta Longo says 0 0.7 to 0 0.8 gram per kilogram of body weight below the age of 65 and slightly increase it over the age of 65. So I'm 62. So according to him, uh, 0 0.7 or 0 0.8 is sufficient for me. I don't need to increase it to 1.6. Dr. Christopher Gardner doesn't specify the protein amount, but he says most Americans are getting over 0 0.8 grams already anyway. Therefore, they don't need to worry too much about the protein intake. They don't need to try to increase the protein intake. If they do, they may have some other risks such as heart health. So it is a bit confusing. I mean, you know, each expert sounds very convincing to me. Um, for me, you know, Dr. Londa Patrick or Peter Atia, I listen to their podcast often. So if they say, you know, higher protein intake is important, then they sound very convincing to me. Also, people like David Sinclair, Christopher Gardner are, are convincing too. So honestly, I don't know. I don't know who to believe. I don't know what to think about it. Whether 0 0.8 gram is enough or we need 1.6, I don't know. But, but this is because I'm not a nutritionist and I'm not an expert like those people. So, you know, I'm not here to be able to evaluate their research. They know way better than I do. But if you know a little more about nutrition and things, and then I recommend this video by Simon Hill, uh, The Proof Podcast. Uh, he has an excellent video called Protein Masterclass, where he interviews all those experts, the experts that I just mentioned. So you can, you can listen to what each expert says and then decide for yourself. Who sounds most convincing to you? Then you can uh, decide for your situation. Now, one thing all experts agree is that in order to increase your muscle mass or muscle strength, you need to do strength training. Protein is important, but more than protein intake, strength training helps your muscle mass a lot. So before thinking about your protein amount, you need to focus on your strength training. So the, the goal is not so much to increase your protein, but the goal is to increase your muscle, increase or maintain your muscle mass and muscle strength. Why do you want to do that for all the individuals? I mean, you, you're not athlete, at least, you know, I'm not trying to be athlete or, you know, bodybuilder or anything like that. So why do I need a muscle mass? This is to because we want to prevent from injuries like falling. Once you break your hip bones, uh, you are more likely to be bedridden and then you will not able to move around, exercise, and then eventually you will develop some other diseases and, and, and stuff. So to increase your health span, Preventing falls is critical, and therefore you need muscle strength. But this is not the goal. The goal is to prevent from falling. Then you also need bone strength, and you need balance and flexibility. Therefore, you need a protein, but you need to do some muscle strengthening exercise bone strengthening exercises, and balance and flexibility exercises too. And heart disease, you also want to prevent 
from heart diseases. Therefore, to increase your health span, you need to pay attention to two areas, injury risk and disease risk. Both are equally important. To reduce your disease risk, autophagy is key. That means you don't want to activate mTOR all the time. What about butyrate producing bacteria? That is something nobody talks about. Uh, so this is the bacteria that I've been talking about. It's the longevity bacteria discovered in Japanese centurion's gut. So there's a place called Kyotango region in Japan where there are three times as many centenarians as the national average. And then the researchers of Kyotango longevity cohort study discovered those centenarians have high amount of butyrate producing bacteria. And since then, this bacteria is called longevity bacteria in Japan. And one of the researchers of this cohort study, Dr. Yuji Naito, says that they have discovered the correlation between resident muscle mass and the amount of butyrate producing bacteria in their gut. So they are not sure, but they think there is some sort of relationship between the butyrate producing bacteria and their muscle mass. So if this is true, what about if you have a high amount of butyrate producing bacteria in your gut and you take 0.8 gram of protein and if you have a low amount of, of butyrate producing bacteria in your gut, if you take 1.6 gram, does it make any difference? That's something nobody talks about. So that's something we don't know. But this is certainly an interesting point of view. So when you look at this whole protein argument, the other elements are critical too. So instead of just looking at pure protein, so this is the problem of science. Is sometimes they only look at one element, just one nutrient. But we are influenced by so many factors in our life. Not only the protein, we need to look at things holistically. We need to look at other nutrients, exercise, and gut bacteria. What about circadian rhythms? When we talk about protein intake, you know, 0 0.8 or 1.6, most people are talking about it throughout the year. I mean, I haven't heard people talking about you know, you need to take this much protein in summertime, but this much in wintertime. But doesn't season affect? Because if you look at the hunters and gatherers time, they had food scarcity in wintertime. They had a higher food supply in summertime, and they had lower food supply in wintertime. Therefore, they had a differences in their protein intake. And often, whenever we talk about health, we often say that our body was made up during this period. Therefore, human body still react to the condition which was built during this period. And this is not only the hunters and gatherers period. Throughout our history, most of our history, we didn't have even the food supply. Our food supply was very much dependent upon seasons and climate. It's only the recent decade or so uh, when we can have constant food supply throughout the year because of the global trade and global agricultural and economic system. Before that, we naturally had a lower food supply in winter time. So does it mean we should take more protein in summer and less protein in winter? Isn't that more natural? I don't know. Therefore, instead of deciding on one number such as 0 0.8 or 1.6 throughout the year, I decided to try an experiment. So what if I took 1.6 gram per kilogram of body weight 
during the summer or the warm season, in my case, from spring equinox to autumn equinox, and then in winter from autumn equinox to the next year's spring equinox, go back to 0 0.8 gram. What would happen? That would be interesting. So I decided to uh, try that. You can also divide this into four seasons. So for autumn, for example, you can do 1.2 gram and spring as well. So summer, 1.6, spring and autumn, 1.2, winter, 0 0.8. That may be interesting too. But anyway, this is just me. And for you, you need to decide for yourself. Uh, I recommend that watching that Simon Hill's you know, protein masterclass, and then think about all those elements and then decide for yourself. But to do that, you need to look at those elements, injury risk and disease risks, uh, muscle health, bone health, heart health, brain health, and gut health, different nutrients and bacteria. Do you have sufficient beneficial bacteria in your gut? That means you need a well-balanced diet. Regardless of your protein intake, you need a well-balanced diet. You need to have sufficient intake of all nutrients and bacteria. And finally, you need to pay attention to circadian rhythm. So my summer protocol, uh, my dietary regimen and fasting regimen, because fasting is important in order to activate autophagy. And so how do I maintain this mTOR and autophagy balance and you know, if I have a higher protein intake, that means I might induce mTOR more often. So how do I balance it? For details, please read the book, chapter three and chapter four. The book is available on Amazon, the foreign Amazon site as a print-on-demand paperback, and it is also available as Kindle ebook. That's it for today. Thank you for watching. Again, my name is Hachiak Takamiya, the author of Live Wiser, Not Smarter. If you like this video, please give me your thumb up and subscribe to my channel. And please leave your comment. What is your daily protein intake? Thank you. Well, I will see you in the next video. Live with your Ikigai!